If you were a boy or girl who grew up loving the game, odds are you love the Game Boy, but despite its more kid-friendly name, this thing was actually marketed towards adults as well. I don't know, Game Grown Up just doesn't quite have the same ring to it, does it? The reason this thing was so popular out of the gate had a lot to do with the packing game, Tetris. Remember, back in the day, Tetris was way more of a novelty, especially in handheld form, than it is nowadays, where having Tetris on your device is about as much of a novelty as having a calculator or calendar function. And yeah, now, typically when some people say that Tetris is the greatest video game ever made, the response is, well, that's a boring answer. It's like saying water is the best drink. Technically, it's hard to deny its importance, but there's plenty of more exciting choices. Well, luckily, if you're somebody who hates water or Tetris, there are tons of other options. The Game Boy had over a thousand games released for it, in part due to how long it remained popular. Think about this. The Game Boy was underpowered at launch in 1989 and still managed to stay relevant for the entirety of the 90s. During that span, we saw the NES, the Super Nintendo, the Nintendo 64, and we're even getting ready for the own oh my goodness, GameCube by the end of it. And that's just on the Nintendo side of things. Now, while Nintendo managing to have so much success with underpowered hardware was all well and good back in the day, that doesn't necessarily make it something we'd want to use now, or is it? Well, luckily there are a ton of different official Nintendo branded options that I'd be more than happy to go over. After all, the first step to collecting for the Game Boy is to select your weapon of choice. And with that, we should first talk about the system that most resembles an actual actual weapon, the original Game Boy, aka the Grey Brick, aka the DMG. This thing is an absolute beast. It's thick, it's beefy, it's weighted down by four AA batteries and could do some serious damage if you hit somebody with this thing. In fact, quick little story for you, I remember going over to somebody's house as a kid and there were a whole bunch of us. Well, one kid was playing a Game Boy and I specifically remember it was a green Game Boy, part of Nintendo's Play It Loud series. Well, more like play it hard into your little brother's head because he got tired of him asking for a turn and rocked him sideways right in the dome. Luckily, just a bag of ice took care of it, but I don't remember ever going over to that house again. Oh, and by the way, the Game Boy still worked and the older brother just kept on playing. But if you think the Game Boy surviving a blow to a kid's head is impressive, that's nothing. I've seen YouTube videos of people taking a flamethrower to the Game Boy. And if that's still not enough, there was even a Game Boy that famously survived a Gulf War bombing and still worked after. A large chunk of more modern consoles stopped working just from regular use. Okay, so we get it, the Game Boy was durable, but what about actually using it? Well, because of its girth, I'd actually say it's pretty comfortable to hold. The D-pad and buttons feel solid, like something you'd find on a real video game controller. But the screen, oh, that screen. People really like to give this screen a hard time these days, but just hear me out. Yeah, it uses the weird different shades of green, but to me, it's so different that it's downright iconic at this point. Now, what about the backlight, or lack of a backlight, I should say? This is a deal breaker for many, but again, I'd like to make a counter argument for why it's not necessarily all bad. Okay, so by this point, we've been spoiled with all our fancy backlit screens, right? Well, here's the thing. A lot of us spend a huge chunk of every day looking at backlit screens, and it can start to take its toll on our eyes with floaters, spots, headaches, and all sorts of other nonsense. So I've actually found that playing on a non-backlit screen, assuming you have a bit of light, is easier on your eyes. And speaking of light, is it really that much of a problem? We live in the 21st century, we got lights. And sure, one could argue that being dependent on lights makes it less portable, but it's still a heck of a lot more portable than a CRT, and you know how fond of CRTs us retro gamers are. So if you want to play on an original Game Boy, don't let needing light be what stops you. There's plenty of solutions. However, if you do really want that backlight, there are some options. Perhaps the most obvious one is the Super Game Boy, which is an accessory for the Super Nintendo, and maybe even the best accessory for the Super Nintendo. They're generally pretty easy to find and affordable, so as long as you have a Super Nintendo, like any law-abiding retro gamer would, then you're all set. 
The benefits are obvious. You can play on a TV with a controller and with varying degrees of added color and special borders depending on the game. Also, if you're a fan of scan lines, then this is probably one of the best ways to play Game Boy games with scan lines. I should mention that technically you would need the Super Game Boy 2, Japan exclusive, in order to play the games at the proper speed, but it's such a minuscule difference that most people would never even notice the difference unless someone told them, which I just did. Aren't I a jerk? But what if you still want portability with a backlit screen? Well, a very popular solution is the Game Boy Advance SP, which plays every kind of Game Boy game, and specifically the AGS 101 model with a backlight instead of a front light. But I actually have a couple problems with this one. For starters, the buttons and D-pad are just simply not as good as previous Game Boys. They're still perfectly usable, but think of it this way. If these buttons and this D-pad were stuck onto a real game controller, people would criticize it big time. The D-pad and buttons on the original Game Boy feel more like a traditional controller. Heck, I'd even say the Game Boy Pocket and Game Boy Color have much better D-pads and buttons than the Game Boy Advance SP. There's also the regular Game Boy Advance, which may just have the best form factor of all of them. And sure, you still need light, but once you've got that, you're all set. Whereas with the SP, you're just stuck with those buttons no matter what. But going back to the Game Boy Pocket and Color, those do offer some obvious advantages over the original Game Boy. The most obvious thing is they're even smaller, with the Pocket delivering on its name being able to easily fit in your pocket. And the Color also delivering on its name with, you guessed it, Color. There's actually a bit of controversy among gamers as to whether the Game Boy Color was a true successor to the original Game Boy or not. You're entitled to your opinion either way, but if we're being honest, in large part the Color served the exact same purpose the regular Game Boy did late in its life, which was being the thing people used to play Pokemon. Heck, even the Pokemon Gold and Silver cartridges designed for Game Boy Color still worked on regular Game Boys just fine. Some other notable differences would be the batteries each system uses. Of course, this was a much bigger deal back in the day, with kids constantly having to beg their parents for more batteries, or, you know, the even more obvious solution of just stealing batteries out of the remote and playing dumb when asked about it. Nowadays, you can just use rechargeable AA's and AAA's, so it's really not an issue. One last thing I'd like to mention before I talk about the games is that it is quite popular to have Game Boys modified with backlights, so you can always modify them yourself or buy one already modded. There's also the Analog Pocket, a modern alternative that looks pretty nice but could potentially be hard to find and or expensive. But what about the games? After all, none of this hardware means jackety smackety if there's no good games to play on it. Well, like I said before, the Game Boy had a ton of games released for it with quite a few notable classics. And the best part of it all, yep, they're generally pretty cheap, especially compared to some other retro consoles that have games so valuable you need to make sure to include them into your will. When it comes to Game Boy games, the best sales pitch I can give you would be this. Do you like video games from the 8-bit and 16-bit era? If you're watching this channel, I'm guessing yes. And then the key follow-up question is, would you enjoy more bite-sized versions of these types of games? One of the biggest things you've all told me that you enjoy about retro games is the immediacy of it all. You can jump right in and get a quick fix compared to modern gaming. Well, the Game Boy takes this a step further. Most of the games are very short, and the ones that are longer generally include a save or password function. The games typically aren't as complex as home console games, but that doesn't mean there aren't still some really spectacular ones. Here I have a handful of games that I would recommend, after all I did decide to pick them up myself. Okay, so here is the best advice I can give for picking which Game Boy games to add to your collection. Pick up the games that are inferior, watered down ports of the console games. Oh wait, no, do the opposite of that. Go for the games that are original and unique to the Game Boy. For example, Donkey Kong on the Game Boy is inspired by the arcade game, but it's a unique game built specifically for the Game Boy, and it might just be the best game for the system. Oh shoot, Link's Awakening fans, I take it back, I take it back. That being said, some of the quote-unquote watered-down console games are still pretty good and have portability going for them. Plus, don't just assume that any game with the same title is automatically a watered-down port. For example, Battletoads has the same title and cover art as the NES game, but nope, it's an entirely different game with its own unique levels. 
Also, remember when I said most Game Boy games were pretty cheap? Well, luckily even some of the more expensive Game Boy games can be had for far cheaper with the old tried and true trick of imports from Japan. That's right, no region locked baloney to be found here. Game Boy games are region free without any sort of modification required, even all the way up to the Game Boy Advance, so remember that and remember that well. For example, Mega Man 5 has a US cart that costs hundreds of dollars, but I got the Japanese version for 20 bucks. Game Boy games typically don't have much text in them, and some of it is still in English anyways. Okay, now what about storing and protecting games? Well, Game Boy games have what might be my absolute favorite type of official protective cases. It just feels like a way of giving your cartridges a nice warm protective hug, letting them know that everything's gonna be all right. Oh, and while we're talking about taking care of the games, look out for the cartridges that have wear at the top of their labels from kids impatiently pulling them out the wrong way, as opposed to the right way where you utilize the concave grip on the cartridge. As far as accessories go, I've always thought it was a cool idea to pick up one of the official carrying cases from back in the day, and again, they are affordable. The Game Boy is also known for having some rather odd accessories. For example, this sonar attachment for fishing, and even a device that sedates kids while they're playing Game Boy. That feels like one step short of poisoning candy to me. But all this stuff pales in comparison to what I think is the absolute greatest accessory for the Game Boy, and it's not even close. The Game Boy Fanny Pack. Oh yes, I definitely need to get me one of these, and you can bet that I would store my Game Boy in it and whip it out in public. Remember, I'm a proud retro gamer who likes to game on the go and let everybody know. What it really comes down to for me with the Game Boy is that it's an experience. It could easily be credited as what popularized portable gaming, and it's really hard to deny the nostalgia I get from it. I think what the Game Boy has going extra for it in the nostalgia department is because it was portable, it was a part of our lives wherever we went. The home console is just you farting on your couch or floor, but the Game Boy experience, no, it was so much more. It was you farting on car rides, farting at the school playground, farting at your sister's basketball game. Okay, yeah, you probably weren't always farting while playing, but my point is, there was a lot more variety. The Game Boy is special to me because it reminds me of so many different parts of my childhood, and works so well as a retro experience now due to the bite-sized experiences that are so time-friendly. I love this thing, and you might just love it too. So with that, please do feel free to share your thoughts about Game Boy, either back in the day or now as a retro gamer. I'd really enjoy hearing what you have to say. So with that, leave your comments down below, and I will see ya in the next video. He's the retro bird, yeah. And he's talking, talking about video games. He's the